You're listening to the Men's Dating Mastery Podcast with host Alec Chase, bringing you the experts in dating, sex, and relationships. Twenty-one. I don't know why I always like the number 21, but it is fitting that for the 21st episode of the MDM podcast, I have a returning guest to the show, Steve Horseman. Steve and I share a mutual appreciation for deep conversation and authenticity, which always makes it a tremendous pleasure to speak with him. Steve originally appeared on the show in episode 6, where we spoke about the link between neediness, sexual attraction, and masculinity. In this episode, Steve provides a very realistic perspective on marriage, who it's for, and what it entails. He explains why a relationship is not a 50-50 partnership, the importance of being crystal clear on what you want and asking for it, no matter the consequences, and even if that means the end of the relationship. We also speak about shit tests. Now, if you regularly consume information on dating, sex, and relationships, then shit tests are not a new concept to you. However, the way Steve presents it is worth listening to. If you like this episode, then you'll almost certainly enjoy episode 6. So add it to your list. Hope you enjoy the interview. On a separate note, if you have been keeping up with the podcast, then you already know that one of my guests... Frank Kermit has been kind enough to give away three of his products for free to you, the listeners of MDM. These products are an ebook called The Emotional Needs of Women, a three-set audio program called The Art of Charisma from Creepy to Charisma, and another five-set audio program called Pimping Your Pad. These are serious in-depth products that normally go for $270. Frank was generous enough to give them away for free in order to encourage you to keep listening to the show. To get them, all you need to do is go to the show notes for episode 14 called Using Body Language to Create Attraction with Patty Contenta or episodes 15 and 16, which are parts 1 and 2 of my interview with Frank Kerman called The 10 Emotional Needs of Women. You can find all three of these pages by going to the podcast page on mensdatingmastery.com and scrolling through the list. Once you're there, just click on the link under the title free giveaway at the top of any of the three pages to get the downloads. Like I said, these products represent $270 in value, which is why they will be available only until September 16th of 2015. After that, The only way to get them will be to buy them just like everybody else. So get them while they are still free. Now on to the interview. Steve, welcome back. Great to have you with me all over again. Thank you, Alec. Thank you very much. For those who have been listening to the show since its inception, they would, of course, be familiar with who you are. But just in case there are any new listeners, can you provide just a very brief introduction to who you are and how you help guys? Sure, sure. My my name is... Again, is Steve Horseman. My my coaching business is, is called Good Guys to Great Men. And it turns out my most focused niche are men who are at the very end of possibly saving a relationship or at the very beginning of starting a new life in, in relationship with women. Um, my focus is heterosexual men, somewhere between 30 and dead. And uh, it seems like we're all in the same boat. We're either at the end of something wonderful to the beginning of something wonderful. And so what I do is help these guys figure out how to get out of the good guy zone, the nice guy zone, and start living their life a little bit more boldly and actually asking for what they want. Fantastic. I'd like to kick us off with a loaded question. You're either going to love me or hate me for this one. Okay. Uh, But I read your ebook all about how to help guys quote unquote, save their marriage. And so before we get into that, what I'd like to ask is your take on marriage in general. And what I'm getting at specifically is despite the 50% divorce rates that are out there right now, I think a lot of people, men specifically, go around with this idea that once they find the one, they'll get married and then life will get easy the work will stop because dating is hard work. You have to go out, you have to meet people, you have to go out on dates. And there's this notion I find out there that once you find someone, once you get married, that's it, you're done. You live happily ever after. And so can you bring a little bit of reality to that 
notion. What's marriage really about? I can. And I, I thought for sure your your question, your loaded question was going to be, here you are, Mr. Expert, writing an e-book on saving marriage, and you're divorced. Who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> Great question, but I won't answer that one right now. I have an answer for that because I've had to answer it a lot. Back to your question. Yeah, I was that guy. I was the guy who got through a lot of cohabitation and dating and fumbling around with sex and finally getting a woman to like me enough to to want to get married and thinking that that was the uh, beginning of the easy street. You know, finally the hard stuff is over and now I've got a lifetime contract of, of sex and companionship and appreciation and love. And the one thing I would tell any guy who's thinking about marriage is that if you're not at a point in your life to where you're ready for something to kick your ass into gear, something that's going to challenge you to to grow and learn more than anything ever did all through school, I wouldn't get married. Because if you think you've got it all figured out and that you're pretty much as good as you're going to get as a man in this life, and now you're going to coast through marriage, you're screwed. You're so screwed. Because what a woman does, she's uniquely designed, whatever your faith is, she is uniquely designed and qualified to trigger so much crap in us, good and bad, that if we're not ready for it and we don't see it as a gift to learn by and grow by, we're going to start to resent her. We're going to start to have contempt for the stress she's bringing to our life. And this is why so many marriages end, because people don't see that. The opposite's true, too, right? If I was just talking to a group of women, I'd say the exact same thing to them. And so this is why the divorce rate so so high is because they don't see it. And it's not to say that those marriages that survive do see it. A lot of the marriages that go 50 and 60 years are surviving on roommate status, right? They're surviving on good enough. And I don't recommend that either. But, but I think you can thrive in any relationship on your first date or your 60th wedding anniversary if you see your partner as somebody who's designed to help you grow and get better. Regard them like that and you'll never go wrong. You know, you just said something right at the outset that I did not expect. And you said, if you were doing it all over again, you would not have gotten married. And what do you mean by that? You wouldn't have gotten married at all, or you wouldn't have gotten married at that time? Yeah, I wasn't sure if I said I wouldn't have gotten married. If I was doing it all over again and, and got to coach my young self, I would tell myself, don't get married if you're not ready to start a process of learning and growth. That's what I would have coached myself. And, and, you know, when you're 25 and you think you're pretty hot stuff and you got a good job and your first new car and, you know, you think you're, you pretty much got shit figured out at that point. And, and it's so wrong. It's just the very beginning of your growth as a man when you get into a long term committed relationship with a woman. So if I had to coach myself, I would uh, I'd, I'd take myself on a long trip. And, and I guess try to make myself understand this is the beginning of something wonderful if you let it. But if you don't let it, it's going to turn into contempt for you and it's going to turn ugly. And that's exactly what happened. I really like that. So rather than saying, get yourself into a long-term relationship, marriage, whatever it might be, and then just coast for the rest of your life, at least in the romantic department, you're saying, no, you're just getting started. That's, yeah. uh, that's a very good perspective for people to hear. So jumping into your ebook, I've got some questions that are directly based on some of the things you said. And one of them is when it comes to saving a man's marriage, so things are not going well, you say a lot of the advice is based on two assumptions and that both of them are badly flawed. So the first assumption was that marriage used to be great and you want it back exactly the way it was before. And then the second assumption is the only way you get what you want is through the process of equal participation with your partner. And so why are those two assumptions flawed? What's wrong with them? It's based on the, the data that I've collected talking to hundreds of men and including my own marriage. If you ask a guy who's having trouble in his marriage and he wants to save it, to keep her from leaving him or keep him from cheating on her or whatever, and you, and you say, do you want it to go back exactly like it was in the first five years of marriage? I mean, would that be happy for you? And when they're honest, when nobody else is in the room, what they go is, well, you know, there was a lot of crap even back then that wasn't going so well. They'll admit that 
because they, they haven't grown and learned yet in their relationship, they can look back and see an awful lot of dysfunction, a lot of disrespect, a lot, a lot of communication issues, a lot of uh, just not connecting. And so the truth is they don't really want to recreate what they had. They would, they've always wanted to have a little bit better than what they have. That's why that's a, a false assumption that if I could only go back. Of course, some guys want to go back because that's a comfort zone. Like, at least we can be roommates. At least we were uh, not screaming at each other when we were roommates. The second one is that if a guy thinks that the only way to save his relationship is if she pulls her weight exactly the same way, that everything's a negotiation, a compromise, some kind of sacrifice, and that communication and equality is the path to harmony in fixing something that's broken, again, he's screwed. Because nothing ever happens that way. There's no such thing as simultaneous mutuality in a relationship. And I'll argue that in almost every relationship that's struggling, that does survive, it's because of a man who decides to take a leadership role in changing the emotional energy in the relationship. Almost every woman I talk to who's losing her, her, her marriage will say, I hate to admit it, but I would prefer that he would lead the way out of this. Mm, that's interesting because that goes, if not against conventional wisdom, then certainly against what mainstream publications would normally say on this topic, because usually it is yeah. a two-way street, equal communication, equal responsibility, so on and so forth. So why is it the man that has to lead? What is it that makes that the reality and not what we typically hear? It's because, I, I don't know, I do I don't want to blame the media. I hate to say, I hate when people say society, the media, the feminist, everyone's to blame for all of this. But here, here's the reality. You, you talk to 100 women and ask them what their biggest fears are when it comes to men. They, they, when they're honest, they'll talk about that men have all the power. Men have all the physical strength. Men have all the ability to yell, scream, and intimidate and and the truth is, for hundreds of years, and we, we're not that far into our human existence, actually, uh, men have hurt women, they've killed women, they've raped women. Women have a lot of anxiety over the, the male species. And when they're, this is, now we're talking about when they're feeling stressed, right, when the relationship is in struggle, what they would most like to feel is an environment of emotional safety, where they they can be themselves, they can be relaxed, they can say what they want to say, they can love, they can laugh, they can have sex, and they can feel safe, not judged, accepted, approved of. And they look toward men to provide that environment because it's very easy for us to provide the opposite environment for women. This applies to your first date, not just to a marriage. So to answer your question, Alec, most of the women I talk to, as feminine and strong and powerful as they are, will admit that if a man is willing to step up and lead the way toward emotional safety, she'll be much more willing to follow than if she's being asked to lead the whole thing herself and take charge. Okay. So in a way, you could still say it's a two-way street, but the man is oh, certainly yeah. leading it because the woman has to be willing. And so the way I think about this is that to the extent that you as a man can control your own behavior, your own environment, you do so. And then it's up to his woman to either join him on that path or not. Exactly. You said it perfectly. You said it perfectly. And, and you can imagine a guy doing that in his 20th year of marriage or on his first or second date with a woman. It's who he's being that helps create that environment. And yes, I think he needs to, to go first without whining about the fact that she isn't joining him immediately. Don't, I'm like every other guy. Wouldn't it be nice if women initiated sex 50% of the time? But how many guys do you know who are with a woman who initiates sex 50% of the time? Yeah. It's Any? Um... Yeah. And, and it's very much for the same reason. Women are turned on. Women are aroused. Women are made to feel comfortable and desired and attractive when they are being pursued. They prefer men to initiate so they can feel those things. Yet we, we begrudge that. We begrudge that we have that role because we're, we also get to face the rejection that, that they are able to deliver. 
but it's the same dynamic. So I, I'd actually like to flip it around and talk about it from a bit of a different perspective. So we're talking about things in the context of be it marriage or long-term relationship. I don't think it's relevant. And if things are not going well, and so as a man, you decide to lead, you say, okay, so my responsibility as a man is to lead things in the direction that I feel we need to go in, but it is still up to his partner to come along for the journey. And let's face it, she might not. She might not join him on that path. And so I imagine there's probably a bit of fear there. What if I step up and I start doing things that will, in an effort to bring us closer, establish intimacy, more sex, whatever it might be, and she doesn't meet me halfway or a quarter of the way, she just doesn't follow me down that path. I mean, that's got to be pretty scary, right? It is scary. How does it manifest itself with guys that you work with? The fear? Yeah. Well, what they do, when a guy is afraid to say exactly what he means and, and really say what he wants and what he believes and where he wants to go in his life by himself as a man and in relationship with a woman, when he is faced with writing that down, and this is an exercise I do with every client who's, who's having to convince or somehow persuade his wife not to leave the marriage, he finally, for, for the very first time, writes a letter. I have one in front of me. I just clicked on it and brought it up because this guy sent this three days ago. No, no what he did was stick it inside his wife's suitcase who's going on a trip to her grandmother's. He hand wrote this letter. He's gone like 10 years of his life without saying any of the words that he wrote in this letter. And it turns out that every word in this letter is, is absolutely true for him. But for 10 years in a relationship, what he's been doing is playing small. He's been kind of you know, trying to convince her to to love him and to, to have sex with him and be romantic and be affectionate. And and she's been kind of tired. I guess she's gotten tired of the way he's been so tentative in his love toward her. And so, so here he is in his 10th year of marriage and she wants to leave. And, and he's been walking on eggshells for 10 years. And now he comes out with this letter. I'm not sure if this answers your question, but what happens when she reads this letter one of the biggest responses is either a numbing silence because they're not sure who wrote it. They're not, they can't believe he wrote it, for one. Or the, another response the lady said was, oh, my God, that floored me. I can't believe those, the words, those words came out of you. And it, and it felt so powerful. But I'm sorry I'm leaving you anyway. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Because you get this far down the road and you wait this long to speak your truth and reveal yourself to a woman. She can't trust you anymore. She has lost all respect and a lot of trust. And this is why I want guys to start doing this early. Dating guys need to learn how to do this at the first date. You know, I'm going to read just one thing from this letter. I know this guy wouldn't mind anyway, but I won't give his name. He says, this is the fourth paragraph of the letter to her. I know where I'm going from here and what I want out of life in the next 50 years. I'll travel and see the world. I'll be the man that other, others look to for leadership and guidance. I'll be the best husband, dad, son, uncle, brother, and friend I can be. And I'm going to be in a relationship full of love, respect, trust, and affection. A relationship where each of us is the other's biggest cheerleader. And I want that with you. It's always been you. I'm inviting you to go there with me. And so I'll stop there. The letter goes on. And she'll be blown away by this, and she may cry, and she may go, yeah, bullshit. I've, I've seen 10 years of the opposite of, of this, and I just can't trust you. I can't believe you. Who the hell helped you write this letter? I didn't help him write it. You know, it took 10 weeks of, of, of soul searching for him to be able to write this. Can you imagine a woman reading that on the first date? You go to the bathroom, you know, and she sees something on your cell phone, and she picks it up, and she re reads <laughs> You know, this is what happened in my life. After my divorce, I had a letter very much like this I'd given to my ex, soon-to-be ex-wife who just kind of tore it up and threw it over her shoulder. Well, I found the letter later, a copy of it, with my girlfriend, and I handed it to her. And I said, hey, by the way, this is what you're getting yourself into. And I, I reached the point of fearlessness that there was so much truth in there that if she said, oh, my God, this is bullshit, there's no way I can do this, I would say, okay, next, right, you know? Either come in the corral or leave, but don't stand in the door. You're blocking traffic. Um, you can say that with love. When you know where you're going, like this guy does, you can say it with love. But even now, he, he said, I'm 
freaking out, Steve. I'm freaking out how she's going to reply to this letter because I know I'm not supposed to be outcome dependent, but I so want her to see my truth and love me for my truth. That's powerful stuff. I get the sense that you can only do something like this if you are absolutely crystal clear about who you are and what you want. You think that's fair? Uh, yeah. Did you did you hear his clarity when I was reading that part? It, I did. Did you hear how clear he was? Yeah. Yeah, and he had no idea he had that. And it takes a little time to, to get there. Whether you're, you know, he's 38. There's another guy I'm working with who's 57 who's about to get married. He just told me he broke the relationship up this morning because it wasn't until the last, you know, four weeks of working with me that he got so clear about both what he loved and adored about this woman and all the red flags that told him that he probably shouldn't be involved with her. He got so clear. He called me this morning. He goes, I, I broke it off with her. It's sad, but but I finally found out it was the right thing for me. I was so codependent. I can't believe what I saw in myself once I got clear. Clarity. Yeah, Alec, you're right. Clarity. It's king. And all of this really reminds me of something that you say and that I really like, and that's not giving a crap about what your wife or girlfriend or the woman in your life thinks about you. And yeah. actually, you know what? Since I just went and said it out loud, can you tell the guys, what do you mean by that? How can you be with a woman and not give a crap about what she thinks about you? Yeah. And the other half of that saying that I have is that while you're caring deeply about what she thinks and what she feels and what she dreams of, and you're giving your you're giving your masculine gift of attention and approval and acceptance for everything she thinks and feels and dreams of, and you're engaged, you're locked into that for her. That's your gift to her. The guy who can do that at the same time cannot give a shit what she thinks about him. So you, while you're care now you care deeply what she thinks about her life and her dreams and her feelings. You have to be strong enough in yourself and know yourself and your values so clearly that if she is somehow judging you or being snarky or condescending or teasing in any way that disrespects you, you simply don't get offended. And this gets to the thing about people who are so easily offended. I believe people who are easily offended and insulted by everything that goes around them lack clarity about what they are and who they are and what they believe about themselves because they're allowing external input to change the way they feel about themselves. So to repeat, you care deeply about what she thinks, feels, and dreams, but you don't give a shit what she thinks about you. And that's one of the most attractive masculine energies in the world is a man who can stand with her and love her and accept her as she is in her dreams and feelings and also not be rattled one iota from anything she says to you. Because they are, they're uniquely triggered, they're uniquely designed to trigger uh, us in negative ways if we allow it. And so a lot of the shit tests you hear about from women, and I don't mean that it's manipulative or controlled, it's just they're wired to test us in ways to see if we have yet reached that moment of clarity in believing in ourselves enough to not, not be rattled by them. And they'll keep trying. They love to try to rattle a man who can't be rattled. It, to them, it's one of the most exciting things in the world to see how strong that guy is. Yeah, and the way a lot of people explain shit tests is that a woman wants to feel that you're strong enough to stand up to her in order to be convinced that you're strong enough to stand up to the rest of the world on her behalf. Yeah, and some guys will think that that's manipulative or it's playing games or it's bullshit, you know, you know, mind games. Well, the truth is there's a lot of anthropology behind that. There's a lot of science behind why women might do it. And if you could give them a break, and not begrudge it and not think that there's some horrible person, then you could have fun with it. You can actually have a blast being that guy, being the guy who is rattled by it. And watch how she squirms with delight when she sees all of her crap bouncing off of you. And you do this more for yourself than you do for the delight of watching her squirm. This is the best gift you can give yourself as a man. Well, and you know, I don't know if you'll agree with me on this, but I always felt like we talk about women testing guys, but I think guys test women as well. Yeah. You know, I've never been married. And so there's a lot I don't know about being in a relationship that spans many years. But I know when a man and a woman are getting to know each other and they're dating, I know that it's, in my opinion, quite common for a guy to 
put each other in a certain situation and see how she responds and see, is, yeah. is this the kind of woman that I want to be with or is she not? Can she handle, you know, uncomfortable social situations? Is she going to do what she said that she was going to do? Is she going to be selfish or selfless in certain circumstances? I think we test them all the time. And so, yeah. and so I don't think it's a uniquely female thing to do. Do you agree with that? Well, I, I think there's a predisposition, anthropolog anthropologically speaking, is that women do want to know that there is some strength and in, in protection in her mate. And that uh, when she's doing some of those tests, it's to see how rattled and how emotionally secure he is and how well he responds to stress and external threats and things like that. So I think there's some science behind the fact that women tend to need to know that more than we do as men. I think men can play more games. I, I don't see that the that the genetic wiring of a man will test a woman so much in the same way I'm describing, but we do other stupid crap because we want sex so badly. We want to reproduce. We want intercourse, right? We, we just have this drive. It's undeniable that we want that. We'll start playing games, and we'll even read books on how frequently to text a girl and how quickly to respond to her and how to tease her along and, and we, we lose total sight of who we are as a man and what we believe and we start playing these chess games with women trying to trick them into liking us and having sex to me that's a, some incredibly destructive behavior that men do all the time and sometimes it's unconscious because we so desperately want to be liked and desired by women but sometimes we search Search out, search out, pick up artistry tips and of the trade, and we'll start playing games with them. You know, I keep, I always have guys say, "Well, she texted me this. What do you think I should say? Or how long should I wait before I respond?" And I just laugh. I, I said, "Who? Are you? What kind of game are you playing? First of all, you tell her what you want to say flat out, and you say it as soon as you have time to type it out, and then you hit send. Screw all the artists out there who are trying to tell you how to time your response in order to manipulate her." If she can't take who you are when you're at your most raw, honest, vulnerable state, you don't want her in your life anyway. Two things I want to touch on with that. When it comes to all of these little techniques about texting, how to do this and how to do that, I actually see value in them in one circumstance. And a dating coach I know described it as training wheels. So what he meant by that is, for example, you're a very needy guy who, you know, is drooling over women and texts them too much and calls them too much and smothers them. For a guy like that, that might actually be beneficial, I think, until until That's he internalizes point. the things that these behaviors are supposed to subcommunicate. So for example, yeah. if she sends you a two-word text and you reply with an essay, that might betray neediness. <laughs> right? It sounds like Corey Wayne. I, I don't know if you know Corey Wayne, but he, he writes about that a lot. I agree. I totally agree. If a guy is learning on how to not act needy, which is very different than not being needy, by the way, but at least training wheels is learning how not to appear needy with the way you'll ask way too many questions and respond with too many words. Uh, yeah, it's important. And what I, what I believe, or at least what I hope happens if a guy is pretending to not be needy rather than actually not be needy is that if he pretends successfully and he sees positive outcomes as a result, then maybe he'll begin to internalize it and actually become what he's pretending to be. Yeah, and some therapists call it fake it till you make it. And they tell women to do that too if they're not feeling sexy. Make yourself have sex. I know you can't make yourself want to have sex, but at least make yourself have sex with your husband and let the, let the physiology take over. And then you can train yourself into uh, enjoying sex again. And I think it, that's true on many different behavioral levels. If you, you can fake it till you make it. When it comes to neediness in a guy, though, there's some steps about knowing himself and liking himself enough, which is the core of neediness, is, is not loving yourself to start with, where you need somebody else to complete you. But that's a whole other topic, right? So I actually want to jump back just a little bit. I'm curious about... What we were just talking about with respect to playing games and using all of these techniques, whether it's texting or whatever it might be, you said they can be destructive. And I'd like you to elaborate on that. Why might they be destructive? What kind of harm might they do to a guy? Well, I was thinking in terms of the relationship, but it's destructive to him too, because he's not honoring himself. 
He's not honoring his own values for what he believes and how he should respond. And at what promptness is to him in responding to text messages, he's marching to somebody else's drum. He's trying to play by some set of rules that somebody has invented for him. And he's dishonoring himself by not doing it the way he wants to do it. You know, training wheels aside. In a relationship, let's say it's early in the relationship, if you start setting up a model of inauthenticity, being inauthentic around each other and in doing things to try to uh, initiate a response, to try to elicit some kind of reaction, you know, make her miss me by, by not calling her all day long. Yeah, that's just bullshit. That, that's, that's a whole dynamic of manipulation and control. And, and, believe, and she will go tit for tat. And you'll lose the battle, by the way. <laughs> you'll always lose that battle. It, it's so much better to just be who you want to be. If you want to call her, call her. If you don't want to bug her, don't bug her. If you don't want to be bugged, tell her you don't want to be called at work. Tell her that. Say, please don't call me at work. When I get distracted, it totally messes me up. Doesn't mean I don't love you to death. I just don't want you to call me at work. Um, be brave enough and bold enough to say what you want and do what you want to do. You know, it's kind of like lying, right? <laughs> when you tell your first lie, you're screwed because then you have to remember that lie and then you have to lie to cover it up. And then you have to lie about that lie. It's so much easier just not to lie. Then you never have to remember anything. Yeah, I gave up lies in my teens for that exact reason. It was just too taxing. <laughs> it was exhausting. Yeah. <laughs> because if you're going to be a liar, you have to be a good one. And to be a good one, you have to do a lot of work. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. yeah. But there's something I want to emphasize that you just said. And that's if a guy starts playing these games, she's going to go tit for tat. And I think it's important to emphasize that. And that's because whatever you put out there, you're going to get right back. So if you're going to play games, you're going to end up with a woman who's playing games. And chances are that's not what you want. And so... If you want someone who's going to be real with you, then that's how you have to step into the situation. Right. And that's leadership. Model the behavior you expect for yourself. Be loving. Be open. Be vulnerable. Be trusting. Be honest. Be raw. Be bold. Be whatever. And if that's the type of partner you want and you're being that with them and they can't follow you and they refuse to follow you, you kind of figured out that they may not be the right one for you. But a lot of us stay in those relationships trying to keep making those people be like we want them to be instead of letting them show us who they are and believing them when, when they do it. That was a Maya Angelou book, by the way. I have to give her credit. So there's one question I wanted to ask you to bring our entire conversation full circle. And so when I read your book, what I really got out of it is that a lot of guys will behave in a certain way out of fear. They might not be happy with what they have, but they're even more afraid of losing whatever they do have. And so they're, they're kind of stuck in this place of settling for mediocrity. And everything you say seems to indicate that the man should not be afraid of the consequences, rather that he should accept the risk and then act in accordance with his own truth. So for instance, if it's a marriage and there's risk of divorce, you suggest embracing that risk and acting in a way that you feel is right anyway, even if you do risk divorce. So I'd like to hear you speak about that. And I think that will be a nice way to tie up some of the things we spoke about. Yeah, you just did it beautifully. So I'll, tr I'll try to do better better than you, which will be hard. Thank you for summarizing it so well. Yeah, in the book, it gets to a point to where it's almost laughable when, and I'm laughing at myself, not at other men, because I was this guy who, who answered this question here. Where is it? It says, how can you ever have those things that you most want in your relationship when all you've been doing is worrying about what you don't want? That is, I don't want a divorce. I don't want to have an affair. I don't want her to have an affair. Don't want to push her away. Don't want to piss her off. Don't want to make her mad. And so I ask, how can you have in, anything you want in your life if all you're worried about is what you don't want? And then our answer is, because if I tell her what I really want, I'm afraid she might leave me. And, and that's what every guy says. I'm afraid if I push what I want, it's going to spoil everything. So it'll finally break us up. And then, and then you get into the, the humor and the illogical part of that. 
it's illogical to be scared of telling your one and only romantic life partner that you want things like love, romance, connection, respect, and intimacy. And, and that's the only possible place in the entire planet that you're going to ever have that is with this person. But you're afraid to tell her that's what you want for fear that she'll leave you. And the thing that I try to let guys know is that that fear is totally unwarranted. There's a story in your mind about that if she she does leave you, you're going to be alone, you're going to be a failure, your friends will think you're a piece of shit, you're going to be broke, you're going to be pushing a, a, a shopping cart with one bad wheel and a one-eyed dog, right? And you're not, you know, that's where we go. And the truth is that when men start doing this work, when they start getting this clear about what they want, where they're going, like the letter I read from my client, there are a million, at least one million women out there, high-quality women, who believe he no longer exists. They believe that man does not exist. And so you can lose the fear by knowing that you're becoming a man that, that the world wants, not just this woman in front of you who might leave you for speaking your truth. You have to know that you're a man of high value and you're desired by a million women who believe you don't exist. You're a unicorn because men that good have all been taken. That's the story that the high quality women are saying out there. So women hate this part of me because I just said, you know, tell her what you want because if she says no, there's no more fish in the sea. That's pretty much what I'm saying, right? But I'm saying it from a place of love. Love her. Make, try to make her that fish and let her to ask her to come with you. Yeah, you said that it's irrational for you to want one thing and be afraid to ask for that one thing from the only person that can give it to you. Because in essence, you're dooming yourself. If you ask for it and she says no well she said no but then if you don't ask for it then it's no by default and so the logical thing to do is to communicate what you want yeah but what do we do there's so many of us out of fear will whine complain criticize belittle you know we'll, we'll do all kinds of nasty destructive things to the relationship because we're afraid to do the one healthy thing that just might save it what i want most for men what I want most is this feeling of clarity about who they are, where they're going. They don't have to wait till they're 50 to get it and get nearly divorced. But do the work to know what you want and what you believe and where you're going and, and, and what gifts you have to give to the people who, who you allow into your life and give freely. When you become that guy, there is nothing else is hard. Everything else is easy. All you have is your truth and what you're willing to give. And then you get to bring all the people along who want what you want. That's what I want for men. Beautiful. I think that's a very noble thing to want for yourself and for others. Steve, if uh, guys wanted to learn more about you, get in touch with you, where should they go? They should go to goodguys2greatmen.com. That's the number two in between good guys to greatmen.com. They can get my free book on uh, saving a marriage. Uh, they could read a bunch of blog articles. I have a new meditation recording I just released today. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Somebody said, we well, do a meditation recording. Yeah, you can get that uh, off my blog as well. And uh, I, I dabble in Facebook, but my website's the best place to find me. Okay, fantastic. And of course, as always, we'll put all of those links in the show notes. And guys will be able to access them on menstatingmastery.com. Steve, it's been fantastic speaking to you again for the second time. Enjoyed it as before. You too. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thanks for your authenticity. I really appreciate it. That is it for this interview, guys. Don't forget that you can get Frank Kermit's three products, the Emotional Needs of Women ebook, the Art of Charisma from Creepy to Charisma three set audio program and the Pimping Your Pad 5-set audio program by visiting the show notes for episodes 14, 15, or 16, all of which can be found on the podcast page at mensdatingmastery.com. Once you've found the show notes, click on the link under the title Free Giveaway at the top of the page to get the products. Remember that these products represent $270 in value and therefore will be available only until September 16th of 2015. So you only have a limited time to get them for free. After that, you'll have to shell out some money just like everybody else. Thanks for listening, and until next time. Thank you for listening to Men's Dating Mastery, a podcast dedicated to improving the lives of men and the women around them.